Motor Theory. The learning objective for this section is to understand the fundamental concepts of both induction and synchronous motors to provide a good foundation for motor protection. Topics covered include principles of magnetism, principles of electromagnetism, the basic construction of AC motors, the operation of a permanent magnet synchronous AC motor, the operation of an induction motor, the operation of synchronous machines. In order to properly protect a three-phase AC motor, we should start with the fundamentals, a review of AC motor theory and motor thermal modeling. The best place to get started is with a review of some basic principles of magnetism and electromagnetism, which will form the foundation for a clear understanding of AC motor operation. Magnets have two poles. One is called the north, while the other is called the south pole. In this picture, we can see dotted lines that run from one pole to the other. These lines represent the magnet's force called magnetic lines of flux. These lines of flux are closed loops that by convention run from the north pole to the south pole, returning to the north pole through the magnet. When the unlike poles of two magnets are brought together, their lines of flux combine and tend to pull or attract the two magnets together. We can conclude that unlike magnetic poles attract one another. Conversely, when the poles of the same polarity are brought together, the lines of flux produce a force that tends to repel the magnets apart. We can then say that like magnetic poles repulse one another. This attraction and repulsion plays an important role in the operation of an electric motor. When magnetic lines of flux cut through a conductor, a voltage and hence a current is induced in the conductor. The magnitude of the induced voltage and current is proportional to the speed at which the conductor is cut by the magnetic field and strength of the field. When current passes through a conductor, a magnetic field is induced around the conductor. The strength of the magnetic field will increase and decrease with an increase or decrease in current flow. There are several other ways of increasing the magnetic field strength with a given current. The first way is to wind the conductor into a coil. The lines of flux due to current flow will combine to produce a larger and stronger magnetic field. The more turns, the stronger the resulting field. To increase the strength of the magnetic field even further, the coil is formed around an iron core as shown. Magnetic lines of flux can pass more easily through iron than air, and as a result for a given current, the number of lines of flux produced by the current flowing through the iron core coil will be much more than that produced by the air core coil. Until now, we have been using direct current to study the properties of our electromagnet. If we connect our electromagnet to a suitable source of alternating current, we will see that the polarity of the electromagnet will change at the frequency of the applied current, and the absolute maximum and minimum field strength will coincide with the peak and zero current of the applied excitation voltage as illustrated. If a second electromagnet is brought into close proximity of our AC excited electromagnet, the cyclic expansion and contraction of the magnetic field of the excited electromagnet will in effect be continuously cutting the conductor windings of the second electromagnet, which will induce a voltage and hence current in the non-excited coil. This induced current will create a secondary magnetic field as illustrated. Let's take a look at the construction of an AC motor to better understand how it works. The two major parts of an AC motor are the stator windings and the rotor. The function of the stator is to create a rotating electromagnetic field when alternating current is applied to its windings. To see how this is accomplished, let's take a closer look at the stator's construction. The stator of an AC motor consists of a hollow cylinder with electromagnets forming the walls of the cylinder. These electromagnets remain stationary. The rotating field that they form when current is applied is referred to as the stator field. An illustration of how six electromagnets are wired and oriented to create the stator of a two-pole AC motor is shown in this wiring diagram. We can see that two electromagnets have been wired in series for each of the three phases. 
This is called a two-pole motor because there are two electromagnets which contribute two electromagnetic poles per phase to the stator field. The electromagnets are positioned such that the resulting fields are 120 electrical degrees apart. The electromagnets in each phase of this two-pole motor are wired such that when current flows through one pole or electromagnet, it flows in the opposite direction through the second electromagnet or pole. For each phase, the resulting magnetic fields, and hence poles, facing the center of the motor are reversed as illustrated. We have labeled the electromagnets or poles in each phase as shown. To understand how the rotating magnetic field is formed, we will create a convention. When an alternating sinusoidal current is applied to any of the three phases of the motor stator, if the current is positive, that is the current is above the x-axis, the A1, B1, or C1 electromagnets will be said to have been connected and oriented such that the north pole is located on the electromagnet's pole facing the center of the motor, while the A2, B2, and C2 will have the opposite or south pole facing the center of the motor. It is easier to visualize the resultant magnetic field if times are chosen when no current is flowing in one phase. This occurs every 60 degrees. Let's choose a start time when there is no current in phase A. At this time, phase B has current flow in the negative direction, and phase C has current flow in the positive direction. According to our convention, C1 and B2 are north poles, while C2 and B1 are south poles. The magnetic line of flux will leave at the north pole of C1 and enter at the nearest south pole B1. Magnetic lines of flux will also leave B2 and enter the nearest south pole at C2. The resultant vector shown is the vector sum of the magnetic fields formed between the C and B poles. If we repeat this evaluation 60 degrees later, phase C will have zero current flow. Phase B has current flow in the negative direction, and phase A has current flow in the positive direction. With reference to our convention, A1 and B2 will be north poles, while A2 and B1 will be south poles. The magnetic lines of flux will leave at the north pole of A1 and enter the nearest south pole at B1, and magnetic lines of flux will also leave B2 and enter the nearest south pole at A2. The resultant vector sum of the magnetic fields is shown here. If we compare the angular displacement of the field, we can see that it has rotated 60 degrees. If this evaluation is repeated every 60 degrees for the rest of phase A's cycle, we will see that the resultant stator field goes through one complete revolution, or 360 degrees. With a frequency of 60 hertz, this means in one second the field will go through 60 complete rotations and in one minute 3600 rotations. The speed of the rotating magnetic field is referred to as the synchronous speed. The synchronous speed can be calculated by the formula synchronous speed equals 120 times the applied frequency divided by the number of poles. If we apply this equation to a four-pole motor, the synchronous speed is 1800 RPM. Now let's take a look at the operation of a permanent magnet synchronous AC motor. First, we will mount a bar magnet in the center of the stator such that it can rotate freely about its own axis as shown. Then we will apply the three-phase power to the stator and note that the stator's rotating magnetic field will form. Opposite poles of the bar magnet and stator field will attract each other, resulting in the production of torque, which will cause the bar magnet to rotate about its axis at the same speed as the stator field. Permanent magnet synchronous AC motors tend to be very small, from fractional horsepower to less than 20 horsepower. They tend to be long and have a small diameter, resulting in a very low moment of inertia, making them ideal for high-speed positioning applications such as motion controllers. Another type of AC motor is called an induction motor. The rotor of an induction motor consists of a stack of steel laminations with evenly spaced conductor bars around the circumference. This is called a squirrel cage rotor design because the rotor bars and end rings look like the exercise wheel commonly found in the cage of pet mice. Once again, when power is applied to the stator, 
current flows through the windings and causes the expanding and contracting rotating stator field. This field cuts through the rotor bars, inducing a voltage, and hence a current in the rotor bars. The magnitude of the induced voltage, E, and hence rotor field strength, is determined by the equation E equals K phi N, where N is the relative speed that the stator field is cutting the rotor bars, phi is the flux density, and K is the motor constant. The rotating magnetic field formed by the stator causes the amplitude and polarity of the fields induced in the rotor bars to constantly change. This diagram aids in the understanding of how the attraction of unlike rotor and stator poles and the repulsion of like poles of the rotor and stator generates a torque on the rotor bars causing the rotor to accelerate towards the speed of the stator's rotating field. If the rotor were able to match speed with the rotating stator field, the lines of flux in the stator wouldn't cut through the rotor bars, hence there would be no induced rotor voltage, therefore no secondary rotor field to interact with the stator field to produce torque. It is because of this that the rotor will accelerate towards the stator field speed, but will not quite match speed. The difference in speed is called slip. The difference between the rotor and field speed is sufficient to generate enough torque to overcome the connected load and losses. Slip is defined as the difference in speed between the rotor and the stator's rotating magnetic field and is expressed as a percentage of stator speed. Slip is load dependent. For example, if there is an increase in load, the rotor will slow down relative to the stator's rotating field, and as a result, the lines of flux in the stator's magnetic field will cut the rotor bars at a faster relative speed, inducing a larger voltage in the rotor bars, which in turn induces a larger circulating rotor current. This larger rotor current produces a stronger rotor field, which interacts with the stator field to produce a stronger torque to overcome the increase in load. If the load were to decrease, the rotor will speed up relative to the stator's rotating field and, as a result, the lines of flux in the stator's magnetic field will cut the rotor bars at a slower relative speed, inducing a smaller voltage in the rotor bars, which in turn induces a lower rotor current. This lower rotor current produces a smaller and weaker rotor field, which interacts with the stator field to produce a lower torque to overcome the decrease in load. Larger motors tend to be synchronous machines. The rotor of the synchronous motor is constructed similar to that of the squirrel cage rotor. In addition to rotor bars, coil windings are added. These coil windings are connected to an external DC power source through a slip ring and brush assembly. During a start, AC is applied to the stator, and the motor accelerates as an induction motor would. Once it reaches maximum speed, DC is applied to the rotor coils. This produces a strong, constant magnetic field in the rotor. This field locks in step with the rotating stator field. There is no difference in speed between the rotor and the stator's rotating field. 